Well, hey, how is everybody doing? Great, I hope. Um, give me just a second to make sure that I can adjust the volume here. Um, coming to you from Salon Life TV, it is me, Miss B, Monica B. For those of you who know me on a personal or professional level, thanks for joining me. I do uh, apologize for the delay in any updated videos. I have had a rough uh, couple of months, actually, settling into a new um, position, contract negotiations, the whole nine yards, what have you. But I did want to get back um, to making sure that I was dropping content specifically uh, for those who are fans and followers of the channel. Please find my YouTube uh, page, Salon Life TV. If you're here already, thank you. Or please try our YouTube um, page, Salon Life TV. Uh, I'm sorry, our Facebook page, Salon Life TV. Uh, this is going to be a video, and I'm going to try to make it as short and sweet as possible, but definitely get to the facts. As the title states of the video, um, I'll be referring to my phone here. I've got my secondary laptop set up so I can make sure that I'm hitting all of my points of interest that I wanted to um, make sure that I didn't skip anything. So as the post says, natural versus chemically treated hair what makes you more money. So this is definitely a video that's going to go out for the professional cosmetologists or barbers or natural hair designers. Those who are licensed, duly licensed under the scope to treat natural or chemically treated hair. Um, those of you who are wigologists, natural hair stylists, things of that nature, uh, braiders, licensed braiders, all of those that are licensed, this video will probably be for you um, in theory. It's definitely not anything legally that you can apply because doing um, chemically treated hair is outside the scope of your practice with regards to your license. So regardless to where you are in the world, whatever state you're in, whatever city you're in, welcome. I am putting aside a day of lesson planning and development and stuff I've got on the floor here, textbooks that I got out, put all this stuff aside for a few minutes, give my brain a break from that and be able to get on some of this information that has uh, come to me in just kind of passing. But um, I did want to make a case on how we are pricing our services because make no mistake about it, whatever is marketable, whatever people are buying, companies are gonna go out and make it available to you. So I didn't want this to be too much of about where the hair care market in total is with regards to natural hair care products. I did wanna get back to where we are in the salon, what we're offering service-wise and how much money we're making. However, my research was not really showing up a lot as far as the market value. So it was more of a um, in, um, kind of a kick in the butt that I needed to put some type of content out there to be able to um, try to narrow this thing down. So with my research that I've conducted, um, natural hair care is not a new thing, specifically those of us that are African-American descent, African descent, Dominican, Haitian, uh, Cuban, any people of color, um, and you are professional service providers in the salon and barbershop arena. So we can take this as far back as you want to go to your press and curls that were all over the place and then moving into more up-to-date things where we're doing more blowouts, silk presses, things of that nature that are not necessarily gonna traditionally encompass a hot comb or depressing comb, but a few other services where you can manually manipulate the hair through a heated means to get it as straight and, and stretched out and smooth as possible. So that would encompass a entire sphere in itself of products that have just exploded over the past couple of years to help get you there. Whereas uh, we were seeing um, with my numbers here, um, 
it says the dawn of the age of natural hair products. And I'll try to make sure I get all of the links to all of my research uh, down in the description box so you guys will have it. This actually comes from blackenterprise.com. And I wanted to make sure that I was looking when I said market share earlier. I need to find the numbers. So I'm specifically researching um, finance, economics, uh, money uh, generating type of websites or blogs that are out there that I could go and put my finger on a number and be able to share that info with you guys. Um, that's just the thing though. A lot of services, what we do in the salon is just kind of totally under this one umbrella when we say hair care. That can even go back to when people are filing in taxes and um, what you go out and you grab your EIN numbers under. Um, personal care services are kind of all wholly grouped together. But as with a lot of things with people not necessarily in this country valuing enough of are those black dollars and just a general black experience when it comes to that. I don't know if as black people, we aren't doing enough to put our own information out. Um, and that could be lax on our part, but we definitely can't afford to let any other people um, have this voice for us because it's not their experience, it's ours. I don't want to see any more anything taken from our community, from our experience, from our life as black people and told in the narrative through someone else's voice when they, and in fact, are not black or another person of color. With that being said, <clears throat> my research led into blackenterprise.com. And here, again, going into the title of this article, Natural Hair is Big Business for Black Entrepreneurs. That's great, but I needed, again, to grab some numbers. A subheading here, again, states the dawn of the age of natural hair products. Natural hair products, and this is a quick back story on the founder of Curls LLC. And that founder's name is, uh, let me get her first name here. Um, blah, 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 blah. With that being said, we're just talking about the dawning of the new influx of what people are paying for. And mind you, a lot of products that I have talked about recently before other blogs or the posts with other people. When black people are creating products, I don't necessarily believe that the products have to only be sold in a black salon or a black barbershop. But when they bypass us completely and they're only focused on their big box companies, your Targets, your Walmarts, Amazon's a monster now, eBay, places like that, they're selling through their own uh, internet web-based companies. I get it. But if the products, then you want to promote them and you then expect another consumer to be a black stylist or a black barber, not just an at-home mom or daughter, then what do you offer us to bring your product into our salon and to retail it? So with that being said, the amount of consumers that go through the doors of a Target and Walmart, and I think I've heard at any one Walmart that there's 6,000 customers per day in any one Walmart. And you can break that number down to the ones that are open 24 hours and so forth and so have you, but any one Walmart can have 6,000 visitors to one store per day. So I get why the product companies want to focus on the big box stores because they've got the bigger numbers. No one hair salon is going to be able to uh, accompany 6,000 visits every day. The size of us, the location of us, and what we're there primarily service-wise and not retail-wise would be the reason for that. However, um, Retail revenue, and again, this is going into a new class that I'm teaching this week with students. Retail revenue could be a good chunk of just passive income for you. Um, and we're talking as much as about 20% of what you bring home annually. Um, so we need to be making a good enough 
effort to push products that people want to buy. But when it comes down to the numbers, the products have to make enough of an uh, investment sense for us in the salon to purchase them in order to retail them. So you don't get into that haggle of price gouging products, overcharging products, so forth and so happy. Um, so again, I'm trying to research the founder of Curls. I've got her last name here, which is, there it is, Mahisha Dillinger. Um, and she started her product line with her own investment a few years ago, it looks like, of about $30,000. Over the scope, uh, and starting it with, for whatever reason, out of frustration, people not offering enough for her hair, and you got to understand where we were with these ebbs and flows in the beauty industry. Too many times we just get locked into what's hot for this five-year trend. And then nothing else is available. What's hot for the next 10 years? And that's what we make our money on. So with that being said, we've got to get into the habit of understanding market um, share and what it actually takes to keep your business alive. So in and around this time, basically the article talks about uh, where we were in the 70s and 80s with chemical processing, jerry curls, things of that nature, so forth and so on. Um, basically, it seemed that it was a very lucrative niche and people then were kind of moving away from chemical services as much, but you didn't have quality enough products. And this was one of the reasons she decided to um, develop her own. So with her $30,000 investment, and uh, she got started maybe back around 2009 is what the article is looking like. And, and mind you, let's make sure that we're giving the people like Annie Malone and the Madam C.J. Walkers of the world their credit because really nothing about developing your own black hair care business as far as being an entrepreneur there is brand new. So these women have been influenced over years and decades by those that came before us. So I want to put that out there as well. Um, she began to see uh, 2002, I'm sorry, I said 2009. So around 2002, she was in marketing as a manager um, and decided she was going to invest $30,000 of her own personal savings to hire a cosmetic chemist to develop and initiate the product and set up an online storefront. And quote unquote here it says it was very grassroots, says Dillinger, who paddled her products to local salon owners who agreed to sell them in their store. By the end of her first year, she had earned $86,000 in revenue. She continued to work with salons and grow her online following. And by the end of the second year, which should have been 2003, 2004, she grossed $360,000. And by, yeah, in 2003, she grossed $360,000. And by the end of 2004, she grossed $600,000. In 2010, her products uh, began to um, generate so much buzz that she had inked a distribution deal with Target. And as of today, she's also in products such as CVS and Rite Aid. So the last of this article is around 2012, and it values her company at $10 million in sales as of 2012, with a small uh, commercial kitchen that employs about 10 people. Now, I don't know if she left any of those salon or barbershop owners behind her when she got her Target, CVS, and Rite Aid deals, but you've got to understand that as black people, we shop at Target, CVS, and Rite Aid. So if she's only focusing on making sure that she's got a great product out there and the product is reaching the masses, the masses mean more money. I, for one, hope that people are taking her lead and moving forward with her product and now offering the services you need to in the salon. So if we have a product company 
that's valued at $10 million. And salons and barbershops are followers of that product. They're purchasing your product. How much of those products are you using in your day-to-day -day service capabilities set aside from the 20% that you could be bringing in on your annual income when it comes to retail? With that being said, I, again, had a little bit of a time trying to research actual numbers as far as what we're charging. So, chemical services for anyone that's chemically treated, uh, product-wise, I can say that average um, relaxer nowadays could be between 50 to $75, depending on what city or whatever that you're living in. So you still have to look at cost per hour and your labor costs, let alone your retail. Regardless of whatever you do, what you're paying in your outside expenses, what you take home, there needs to be a clear margin there. And this is where people tend to think too much about the creativity of being a great stylist or barber or natural hair designer or what have you, and not enough about being a business person. So those $10 million that the founder of Curls LLC, starting her product sales in hair salons, and then boom, exploding across the world to $10 million, now plus more because this article is dated a few years old. Should our services and what we're doing using these products in the salon not be exploding as well? So my whole reason for doing this video as well is someone who, to me, I thought didn't value what they did on natural hair as well, or they just thought the natural hair was not as big of a thing as chemical work. And the reality is the time and effort that you spend on natural hair, the amount of time you spend on it, it's actually a little bit more taxing on you physically for one. And, and me with blowouts and silk outs and things that I've posted in different videos that I've done. It's a little bit more time consuming than what you would do with a relaxer. So I will say just to get the hair under in nice uh, shape, to get it relaxed, to get whatever style you want to get in it and to get it more manageable. The relaxer, yeah, it really is it's kind of a cheat. I'll put it that way. To get the same result. If the hair is going to be a nice roller set or waved or curled out or what have you, you've got to get the hair manageable either way to do that. For those sisters that are really truly natural, naturalistas, and again, for me, uh, my hair is getting more natural. I just actually finished some braids uh, today um, to, to give it a break from just getting up, shampooing it, and having a comb through my natural kink every day. Um, wearing wigs, I like to give myself a break from that. Um, your natural hair can be a little bit more cumbersome to just make it manageable every day for whatever it works for you. So I can say that most types of chemicals that have been out there from jerry curls to relaxers to texturizers to Japanese thermal straighteners, so all this type of stuff that's been out there to help get that. Now, we got to get away from people that have developed this social stigma, which really and truly comes across as a social ignorance, and believing you are not desirable or you are not um, accepted with your natural kink and your natural hair patterns. Let's make sure that we're leaving that type of ignorance in the past. And people want to be able to get up out of their beds, get their shower, detangle, comb, get a brush to it, do whatever, whatever personal grooming that you have to do. Get your face on if you're wearing it. Uh, get your clothes on. Get out the door. Get on to your jobs. You want to step out of that house with the best representation of you possible. Not that anything about your hair better, more, or less says you're going to do a better, more, or less job as that accountant, that doctor, that teacher, that judge, that what have you. We got to get rid of that bullshit way of thinking. It's about personal care and it's about um, personal management and time management. I'll put it that way. 
So with that being said, if you're going to be knocking out your chemical services work, and let's just say 50 to $75 for an average relaxer, if you're getting into things where you are doing your um, the Japanese thermal straighteners, the keratin smoothings, that is a type of product, whether we're going to talk about high alkaline products such as uh, sodiums and thiols and calciums, other type of hydroxides that are out there or not. If it's anything other than water and water being a chemical in itself, anything other than water going into your hair, it is a chemical. High alkaline chemicals is something else. So a lot of companies have tried to give people that uh, bridge between a lot of product companies, Designing Central is one, and a few other companies make a system what they call a transitional system. People coming out of a traditional hydroxide relaxer and wanting to get more into some type of natural hair, but manageable. So you have that, and I'm seeing those services starting anywhere around 100 bucks and up. Um, California Smooth is a company I worked with years ago, and we used a quinoa-based protein in our um, processing treatment. Um, Chi makes one. Um, Chi Enviro is out there. I think they still have the Chi Transformation, which is still a 9 or 10 step process. 9 or 10 steps in the, the chemical to get through the whole process, so it's still available. So now you're talking about services that are going by the hour. So when I was brand ambassador for Chi, uh, I'm sorry, for um, California Smooth years back, we were telling people on the low end of the market, service-wise could be about 300 bucks. Higher end was going at about six. All depends on where you were in your market. And literally what people made in your area and what you base your services on according to what experience they got in your salon. It's always come down to that, to those numbers. And for people who are not valuing themselves enough, time is out for you wanting to be the cheapest person on the block so more people will come to you. Because nine times out of 10, you're using cheap products because the products, again, Curls is a $10 million company. They are not going to discount their products because you're charging cheaper services. So why in the hell would you not monitor your own profit margin by making your service prices reflect, for one, what your time, effort, years, licensing, and all that money it takes to get that, along with the cost that it takes for you to buy the products in order to do the service. So you've got to make sure that you make it make sense, literally. If it ain't making dollars, it ain't making no damn sense, not to me. With that being said, I wanted to then look at traditional silk presses or Dominican blowouts, and I was able to find a couple. Brazilian blowouts specifically is one. And I'm seeing here where the numbers in 2019 are in between 300 to 500 per service. And now you're talking about length of the hair, texture of the hair, um, based on an average two to three hour service, which will still give you a roughly $100 an hour per service. A silk press for another salon, uh, I'm seeing runs about $75. Um, I was trying to see if they were having kind of where they were keeping you scheduled as far as the minutes. Another one here, the Blowout Express, is $55. That is listed at 45 minutes. The Silk Press on the time that they guarantee is not listed. Um, and another one here is a Platinum Silk Press Blowout. That is at $95. Another one is the Blowout and doesn't say too much of anything else. It's listed here for 55 minutes at $65. So regardless of what, I'm seeing services should be between 60 minutes to an hour, maybe an hour and a half. 60 minutes, they give you an hour. Hour and a half would be 90 minutes. Two hours uh, would be 120, between 65 to $95. So if you're going to break that down on cost to you, 
cost of your product, uh, cost of your utilities, cost of your licensing, your insurance, everything is tripled into every service you do. Cost of your rent, cost of your advertising, cost of your phone, cost of your business cards, whatever you're still giving out and using or social media accounts. Any percentages you're giving up to booking services uh, like Booksy or um, what's another one? Uh, it's not behind the chair. Um, style something, Style Seat. That's it. Style Seat, Booksy, other appointment booking services like that are probably grabbing, I don't know, range 10% or something for you to post a profile in your services and get booked through those apps. Um, I'm hoping stylists are still trying to bring home about 50% of that income. And I don't need to knock what I do and how much I charge because of what someone else can't afford. If you can't afford what I charge, then I wish you well in finding someone else who does. So what you've got to do is understand that Chemical work and natural hair work are two very different animals. You charge accordingly. And the older you get in the business, kind of the more lax people may be, especially if it becomes more of a popularity contest with people that know you and like you. So they come to you for that reason versus coming to you because you are a professional and this is the level of care that you give when you're performing that service. So I'm going to probably do a part two on this because, again, I did not see a market share number for what we're actually doing to break down chemical work, chemically treated hair versus natural hair. I'm seeing it, as always, by the service for whatever salon just kind of pops up on my um, research. And what's gonna happen is if we don't pin down these numbers, it's another thing that companies that are out there who do not value what we do because they're not licensed professionals. They've never been in school. They've never struggled to get through school. They've never had to take a test. They've never desired to become a teacher, went back to school, sat back in another classroom, trained again, tested again to become a teacher. They have no clue, really, what it is for us at heart. We, however, have got to stop thinking so much with our emotions with regards to what we like to do and what we're in love with doing and understand that this is still a business because there's still powers that be that are out there that are trying to devalue everything what we do. And that devaluation shows up in deregulation. There's another article. I would try to post it. It just came across in a change.org. Uh, follow me there, change.org, for repeal cosmetology salon licensing, uh, oppose cosmetology salon licensing repeals. That is my personal petition. And I keep it going specifically when I see other states are having the same issue. And uh, Colorado, I believe just a week ago. Another petition comes through, another Facebook page comes through where a company that's a blowout company has decided to approach legislatures in that state to try to deregulate cosmetology as a whole because of what that particular company feels that they cannot legally hire people to blow dry hair only without a full cosmetology license. So their argument is we're not a full cosmetology salon, we're only doing blow dries, so there's no way that we should have to wait to get um, people to work for us for an entire year to finish cosmetology school if they're only going to be blow drying here. Bullshit to that company and bullshit to any other company that tries to do the same. But because our numbers are not properly reflected, this is what companies like that use 
to approach legislatures on a state level. And if it goes statewide, it will go nationwide because we no longer have a legislative arm. National Cosmetology Association disbanded some years ago, or they um, partnered with Pro Beauty Association. That company, from my experience with them, and I have a membership there, but as of three to four years ago, when I actually was on the hunt to find information of where NCA left off, what NCA's uh, contacts were, any leads that they had in the D.C. area for deregulation that was happening in my own state, again, Alabama, my home state. And I got two to three different people transferred to, and everyone is drawing a blank and scratching their ass. It left me frustrated and with no need to ever place another phone call to that company again. Uh, and definitely no need to follow up with an email if you couldn't give me anything on the phone, I didn't need an email and you telling me the same thing. So we don't have that legislative watchdog for us. We have to be our own watchdog. You got to make sure you're sitting on your porch with the lights on so no motherfucker is going to run up in your house and do whatever the fuck they want to do in your house and get away with it. You got to be your own pit bull, you know. Um, with that being said, as much as I love this industry, I know that it is a business. And you have to attack business the way other business people attack business. So when they attack, we counterattack. It's not enough to just stamp our feet and bang the table and scream and yell. And you're not going to take away my license. Because just as laws allowed us to train and educate and test to gain the license, those same laws can be changed. And deregulate us across the board. No license is no longer needed. So we're trying to talk about going out and grabbing $100 per service. Or you're going to kick at least 50% of that out in whatever you need to do when it comes to your expenses. And taking that $50 home per hour to feed your kids and pay your bills and pay the taxes and live in the same house that these damn people that can walk into that salon with no license, and take home that same money as you. Stop waiting until the other shoe drops to realize that when both shoes fall off, we're all walking around here barefoot-ass people on pins and needles. And walking around barefoot on pins and needles, I can only imagine how hurtful that shit would be and uncomfortable. I don't make an effort to do it now. So I would never wait for the other shoe to drop. My whole issue is how to keep both my fucking shoes on and walk my ass through this jungle called professional cosmetology, barbering, salon life. Walk through it, the jungle of that with both shoes on, run through it, march through it, do whatever it is that I have to do until I'm no longer able. This is an industry that has given life to me, fed me, allowed me to travel, buy wigs, weave, makeup, eyelashes, what have you, live in different cities, work in different states, and almost 30 years in, the fight is still there. The fight is still there. I find myself fighting more now than I did my first year in and getting involved in things with like NCA. Um... Would the answer be that another national professional organization has got to step up for us? The reality is, are we too damn lazy to support that organization? And support is not, yeah, 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 rah, rah, rah. No, these people have got to pay representatives to go to Washington, to go to your state capitals and attend your board meetings and sit down when these legislative reviews are coming up, when these sunset meetings are happening when these lobbyists are approaching legislatures with their brides and their bags of coins and shaking them in front of these guys and say, hey, let's make a deal. Our watchdogs are no longer there to stop that shit. So we can't get so blinded by just the pretty hair and the pretty nails and making whatever coin you are making that day because if the money you are making is not going towards, I mean, minimum fees I pay. For NCA, that started out as a stylist in the 90s. I mean, my God, I think I was paying $50 a year. If that, then, 
if that. And to know that I don't even have that organization anymore, and that's when I've spoken to people that in my home state, Alabama, of why it was disbanded and reached out to PPA years later, uh, hearing other people and little yank yin yang, um, people had stopped paying their membership fees, and they were not supporting the organization. So they couldn't afford to keep people, those soldiers, on the ground doing the work. A lot of times our people just kind of grow with this industry and it grows up and it grows out and everything retires. But the problems, the issues, the bullshit is going to keep growing and showing up. It'll be a different monster this year or that year. It'll look a little different, sound a little different, smell a little different. But I guarantee you, you take the bow off of that and look inside that box and you still got a big box of bullshit. I don't care what you spray on it, what you wrap it in. You put it in a square box this time or a round box before, it's still bullshit. And that's ultimately what we got to find ourselves being mindful of. So whether you're now focusing only on natural hair, you're focusing now or more on chemical hair, make sure you're doing a good job that you have a good website out, got a, a good digital footprint somewhere that people can find your information. So when we have to compile this data and send it off to things like the Labor Department, send it off to things like the IRS, so we can now substantiate that as a professional licensing industry, this is what we do and this is why we do it and this is what we do based on income. And this is why our industry is still a valuable and much needed income. So the naysayers that are unlicensed, that are outside this industry, that are sitting around outside on the street waiting to run up in your house and take all your shit out of your house from you, they ain't got a pot to piss in. Nor wonder to throw it out of. They got no leg to stand on. Because money matters. Let's be real on that. Money matters. Money talks. Money makes shit move. And all other bullshit rides a bike, or it takes the bus, or whatever the slow-ass way it takes to get to the finish line. Um, so I, I just kind of, again, the, the challenge in even finding the information for me was a little frustrating today. Um, I didn't want to go off too much of, of a rant on that, but I just really and truly wanted to make sure that People that are performing natural and chemical hairstylists. If your natural hair services, your blowouts, your presses are all everything right now, great. But stay in the business a little bit longer. As long as I've been in it. If what's in trend now is going to be out of fashion two or three years from now, you're going to have to learn to do something else to make that money and make the income. Even as a teacher now, I'm not solely completely out of the game. Professional hairstyling is riding a bike for me. So I get to do that every day as I'm teaching, but I know that my brain is no longer only in the realm of just being a hairstyler. So I'd rather see my income come from different things now in the industry that can afford me to do different type of work where I don't physically, it's not so physically taxing on myself. So for those of you who do know me on a personal level, I am an almost 15 year survivor of lupus. And my RA in these hands, at whatever time that they decide that it wants to act up, it's aggravated severely when I think that I'm going to be in the salon busting it out uh, like I used to. I make an effort to find a salon to get in at least on the weekends during peak times out of the year and um, maybe maintain something, a relationship with the salon here and there. For that reason. So like holiday time is coming up. I'll try to find something that I'll be working in on a Saturday or Sunday to get through the holidays. And that's it when it comes to uh, hair care or anything else. My next focus for myself salon business wise is um, microblading. Great industry. Um, and I know they're now paying. I'm on the West Coast right now, Washington State uh, from the salons that I've researched here. Uh, and I know, can see what people are paying, four to 500 bucks a service 
per service. And we're talking about less than a one hour service. For an average hair care client and an average basic cut in a color or a blowout service that would still need to be four clients at $100 each crammed into that same one hour, if I can manage it, to make the same 400 an hour that one microblading service per client could make me per hour. So make the money make sense. That's all I can say. Never get comfortable. Never get satisfied. Always be on the hunt for squeezing in your day and those peaks of time that we have with no appointments, making sure that you're getting out and reinvesting in your education and you're able to make sure that if you're your own machine, you're the business owner, you're the receptionist, you're the stylist, you're the shampoo girl, you're all of that, that you are properly compensating yourself for all of those hats that you have to wear. If not, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. And again, a lot of us as small business owners, entrepreneurs, booth renters, studio owners, uh, salon owners, and it's just you and you and your clients, I hear all of that and I love all of that and I did it years ago. I will never be in a situation where I allow myself to think that I can do everything. And when this one piece of machinery is on the fritz, then I got no more money coming in because my biggest tool, which is me, my hands, my arms, my legs, my feet, and all of the joints that rheumatoid arthritis aggravates in between that, when I have periods that I'm physically unable to do it, I got no money coming in. I will never put myself in that position again. Um, so with teaching, educating, now blogging, it allows me to do much more um, and use this big brain up here to get that information out and to bring those years of experience and the passion that I still have and learning to do something different at least every year. I try to go after a new certification, a new training, a new something and I try to make sure that I'm able to supplement that income as best that I can. Um, so with that being said, um, I wanted to round this out with one last number that I did find. And this is about the black spending dollar. There are a lot of ups and downs you're going to hear on numbers, but I just kind of kept coming back to this one main point because it did encompass most things that I was looking for. And this article is um, from Glencore, or Glen Corporation, which is a blog, and its title is The Ethnic Hair Care Market Trends and Formulation Solutions. What all the rest of that is, I don't know, but what I am looking for is in a subheading here on the market opportunity for scalp treatments, lightweight hair oils. I kept going, kept going, kept going. What I'm looking for is under the natural hair movement, ethnic hair care market. So again, I've been looking for market share or the piece of the pie that's carved out for what we're actually spending money on in its total. Again, I couldn't find enough of a market share for the actual services that we're offering in the salons or the spas or our barbershops um, separate from products and where they're valued at. Plenty of information out here on product companies, but not enough on services. So I'll go with what's what. All right, this states, the power of individualism is the growing space of multicultural beauty and it has led to a shift in beauty ideals where men and women are embracing their cultural identities and expressing themselves through fashion statements where curls and afros have once again become the center of attention. I do love that and thank you for that. And I am really and truly hoping that this was written by a black person, regardless, to give us that empowering and impassioned statement. In total, however, this is the last thing I'm going to leave you guys with. The ethnic hair care market movement drives the need for products that address curl control, a predominant concern for the ethnic consumer. It prevents hair breakage and frizz and product development and growing application areas such as innovative hairstyling and intensive conditioning products must meet today's consumer needs and their hair care regimens to maintain and beautify their natural hair patterns. The bulk of that or the crust of it is I want to make sure that I'm investing in ethnic hair care products, that the products are going to be products that my kinky, nappy, 
coarse curly hair actually needs and is going to benefit me. I don't need to widify myself to be considered ideal or accepted anymore. I need something that works for this type of hair for me. And rounding it out, it states that the black spending power, black dollars, as in black dollars matter, are projected to increase to from billions of dollars. I've read before, billions of dollars as we are now in 2019, so somewhere around $500 billion is the number for 2019. I'm going to leave you with this. The black spending power is projected to increase to $1.4 trillion by 2020. That's less than a year from now. Less than a year. Black people globally spend money. We're spending money on our black products for our black hair. So people, there's no reason that we shouldn't be making as much money servicing natural hair or chemically treated hair or doing it both and doing as much as we can because I can't say doing it all because there's no such thing. There's no reason that we can't carve out portions and pieces of this pie in the trillion dollar market. I've stated that trillion dollar number before with people with beauty and barber schools and post-secondary colleges. It's right now at $1.3 trillion in a discretionary spending budget for U.S. tax dollars. That's money, uh, I'm sorry, the mandatory uh, tax budget. U.S. tax dollars are $1.3 trillion where you have to spend money. The government takes taxes in, and $1.3 trillion of that money annually has to be spent on education programs. And higher education programs, post-secondary, carve out whatever percentage of that. And then beauty and barber school programs specifically carve out another maybe 10 or 12 percent of that. So the trillion dollar market. All of what we do and who we are as black people is creeping into that. That's just giving a number on what black people will be spending in 2020 on their hair care products. $1.4 trillion. Like, y'all, come on. I'll do another video following up later again on investing in beauty and barber schools, specifically those that we need to rehab or refurbish our black communities. It's doable. So we're already spending dollars like this, but are those dollars really showing back up in our barbershop, beauty salons, or in our communities in general? Someone's making the money. We're spending it, no doubt. So someone's making it. We got to learn how to spend that money and make that same money and enrich, literally. Get rich off your own self, off your own money. Ain't nothing wrong with getting rich. You don't have to demoralize yourself to do that. You don't have to step over people to do that. You don't have to enslave people to do that. You don't have to mistreat people to do it. Because the average black person walking into CVS, Target, Rite Aid, where curls are being sold, they're greeted with smiles. They're greeted with whatever. Uh, even if you got racists that are working in there, they're being trained to not let that racist shit show up on their job. So you're walking in there and you're spending your money. So we spend the money. There's no doubt about that. Who's making the money and who's reinvesting enough with us to make sure that what we spend now reflects with us as a whole as black people? Because if I can't even find numbers to dictate what the market share is for natural or chemically treated hair services, products are out there dominating, no doubt. So who's buying them? You buying some of these products to go and do the services in the salon. So that's that catch-22 that's right right there, guys. So I, I'm going to leave off. I don't want this to be too long of a rant and, and get way too far off course. But um, drop down in the comments and leave me something and let me know what you actually think you're making more money on right now. And if you have been in the business long enough to know where those shift trends and changes are and where they're going to be. And are you prepared for them when they change again? 
So uh, any of my research that I have, I'll leave it in the comment uh, in the description box for you guys. Please let me know what you think about this video. Positive comments only. I'm a positive vibe girl. Anything negative, keep it to yourself. More power to you, but just kind of not this way. Um, I do believe that we can be a change of social, economic, emotional change. Emotional as far as how we attach ourselves to things that are out there. But as far as socioeconomic, black people and black dollars, I can't keep hearing these billions and trillions of dollars on what we're spending out there. And I don't see them billions of trillions of dollars showing up in our communities. And black people still, by and large, are disenfranchised and marginalized. So it's a huge gap in what we spend and what people spend and reinvest with us because we just don't seem to even be doing it with ourselves. And that's going to be another blog. So thank you guys so much uh, for joining me again on this episode of Salon Live TV. If you caught it on YouTube, welcome and thank you. If not, go to Facebook, join me there or request there. Uh, Facebook Salon Life uh, TV. That's at Facebook.com. And we're going to keep this thing moving. Uh, hit me up on Twitter if need to be, Miss B the Teacher, or on Instagram, Miss B, T H A, Miss B the Teacher. Thank you guys for viewing. Have a great day. Please like, share, comment, pass it on. And the more I can uh, get followers and views built up on this channel, the more I'll be able to do a little bit more. So with that being said, I will definitely know that I will be dropping a part two to this. It probably won't roll out until next month because I do plan on going to Afrolicious Hair Summit in L.A. And that will be at the end of October. So I will get there and try to get as much comment uh, as I can. And outside of a couple of natural hair shows to Leah Wajid that I've attended in, in Atlanta years ago, this will be my first uh, natural hair only event in a while so I am really looking forward to that it's gonna be my birthday weekend so I'm gonna kind of tie it all in together but Afrolicious again I'll drop that link down if you know anyone that's there definitely I've already reached out I kind of want to get there and uh, have Salon Live TV show up do some interviews get some commentary uh, even if I have to do it on the low uh, I don't want to be there and um, step on anyone's toes and do anything that I'm not uh, going to be that's not going to be respectful but if even if I just go as an attendee I'll be able to get my questions out to different people and then do a little bit of research that way I'll drop a part two to this video for that reason but again knowing that that show is not until in at LA at least it's not until the end of October it's going to be a uh, part two coming but it will be a month from now so, again, I'll go ahead and I'll make sure we got something else coming out between then. But part two to this video, again, to give more of a grassroots or on the ground feel of where we are with services and products and how they're actually showing up for us money wise. Um, I got to make sure I'm getting, you know, that info directly from the horse's mouth. So with that being said, again, thank you guys so much. Namaste. Uh, have a great one. Thanks again for joining me. Salon Life TV. I'm signing out. Bye. Go